Good evening, everyone. My name is Nakia Franklin. I am the temporary coordinator, uh, temporary Rary diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at Walford College, and will serve as your moderator for tonight. Thank you all for jo joining this event. This event, Women in the Classroom, Part One, the Women's History Month Planning Committee, headed by Sarah Gary in conjunction with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion led by Dean, Dean Taifa Alexander, Nadia Glover, myself, with our student coordinators, Sarah Gary and, and Isaiah Franco, also thank you for being here. As an office, ODI has a social responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which Walford currently exists. As a result, we, we endeavor to acknowledge that, that we gather at an institution of higher learning on the ancestral lands of indigenous, indigenous peoples, past, present, and emerging, emerging in honor and with gratitude of the land itself, and thank the members of the Cherokee nations for their graciousness in helping us learn more about the people who are undeniably linked to the land that Walford is currently occupies. We also acknowledge and amplify the slave, the enslaved Africans who labored to lay the physical foundation of Walford College. As a result, ODI as an office commits to actively engaging and learning more about the history of the land we occupy, how to better be, how to be better steward, stewards of it and continue to honor with intention and respect the historical and current significance of the indigenous peoples and enslaved who suffered in the creation of the college and who are credit with its, credited with its current existence. So tonight's event is a first, first of a two-part series geared towards the entire campus community with the purpose of reflecting on and discussing the struggles which face women in the classroom. In today's sessions, we will speak to a few of the faculty members and FYI instructors to learn more about the professionals' interactions on the campus and where they feel the campus community can improve in reflection to their own treatment of female identifying staff, students, and campus partners. This discussion will be broken into three subparts, discussing the treatment uh, based on gender, analyzing the issues related to toxic masculinity and the phenomena of playing gender and the impact of gen stereotypes in the workplace on campus. As attendees, you all have the opportunity to ask panelists questions at the end of this event. If you do have a question, please send them to Sarah Gary, our host for this evening's panel. Once the questions have been exhausted for the, for the panel, we will move into our Q&A section. Please, please note that any attendee who engages in disrespectful behavior or harassment will be removed from this event. Now, with that said, let's meet our amazing panel. Taifa Alexander, or Dean Taifa, as she is affectionately known on campus, campus uh, serves as the Assistant Dean of Students for diversity and, lead, diversity and Leadership Development at Wofford College. Dean Taifa was born and raised in South, South Jamaica, Queens, New York. She earned her bachelor's from St. John's University in Queens, New York. Queens, New York. Work. And in 2017, she earned her Juris Doctorate or Law Degree with honors from Georgetown Law in Washington, D.C. For the past 12 years, Dean Taifa has focused on her scholarship, research, and practice at the in intersection of law, co critical race theory, and equity in higher education. She recently wrote a scholarly article, Chopped and Screwed, Hip Hop from 
from a form of cultural expression to a means of criminal enforcement that will be punished, published this spring in the Harvard Jour Journal of Sports, Entertainment and Law. And Law. Dean Taifa also recently has been recognized for her impact on the profession by both the CSCCPA and ACPA, as she has gained the SCCPA Joseph Hayward Humanitarian Award and is an inaugural member of the ACPA's 30 under 40 class. However, she recognizes that her accomplishments are reflective of the sacrifices and support of the people in her life who committed themselves to, to her success, like her mother Meredith and her husband James, who she is ex especially grateful for e each and every day. And Katia <laughs> grew up in Kansas, Kansas and attained a BS and MS degree in mathematics from the University of Kansas. She then earned a doctorate in engineering science and applied mathematics from Northern West University before joining the mathematics department at Duke University as a, as a postdoctoral fellow. In 2008, she joined the fa faculty in the mathematics department at Wofford, where she is currently the coordinator of the Applied Mathematics Program and director of the Center for Innovation and Learning. Her professional interests include development of tools to analyze distinct maps for political representation and to prevent gerrymandering. Her non-professional interests include yoga, walking her do dog, and when there's not a pandemic, traveling with her spouse and her six-year-old son. James Dukes currently serves as a coordinator for college access and student success within the Office of Student Success and Center for Community-Based Learning. As a first-generation college student, James earned his bachelor's degree in history from East Tennessee State University and a master's in higher education from Albany Christian University. For nearly the past 10 years, James has worked in various areas of higher education, all while serving in a capacity related to creating a welcoming and affirming space for students, faculty, and staff. James is an active member of Wofford National Coalition Building Institute, or NCBI, and anti-racism action teams. His current research focuses on first-generation college students and the experiences of African-American students attending predominantly white institutions. And last but not least, Catherine Valdi is an assistant professor of philosophy at Wofford College. She received her BA from Lawrence University, where she majored in biology with a concentration in neuroscience and philosophy. She received her PhD in philosophy from Boston University in 2019. Her primary research is in philosophy, philosophy, philosophy science, and the philosophy of biology. But she is also both a teaching and research, research interest in feminism. Thank you all for joining us here tonight. All for joining us here tonight. And let's jump into our first topic, which relates to the treatment of gender. So for those who don't know, gender is, refers to social constructed roles and behavior, behaviors. Hmm. Apologies, guys. Behaviors and attitudes that is given, given society for men and women. Tonight, we will be looking at the ways in which someone is treated because of their gender, how this can be a negative experience, and how it also fits into a classroom dynamic. So panel, for our first question, unfortunately, it is no secret that women are treated or viewed differently in comparison to their male colleagues. For instance, when women are in leadership positions or clear and have clear expectations, they are considered by many as being a B-I-T-C-H, or over-demanding. While a male with similar leadership position 
a similar leadership position may be considered an effective leader and an example to others to strive towards. Have you had any similar experiences? If so, how did you man manage them? Uh, if I could first start with Dr. Katalia. Yeah, thank you so much, Nikki. And thank you so much to the Women's History Group and the ODI, Office of ODI for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, so I've not had the exact situation that you described, but I have certainly had the experience of being treated differently from male colleagues. And I would roughly say that for me, what they have in common is some sort of underlying assumption or presentation that I am less qualified. Um, for example, when I was on the job market, I was told by a male colleague who was also on the job market that I was only getting more interviews than he was because I was a woman. Um, I also get called Ms. Katya as opposed to Dr. Katya or Professor Katya more often than my male colleagues. In general, the way that I try to approach these situations is as moments of, of education. And so when I, when I have a student or someone call me Ms. Katya instead of Dr. Katya, I just say, actually, I prefer to be called Dr. Katya. Um, sometimes I'll say, I worked pretty hard for that degree. Um, <laughs> and with that colleague who thought I was only getting interviews because I was a woman, um, that was at Duke University. And I pointed out the fact that our department of about 50 faculty in that at Duke University had one female professor. So clearly being a woman doesn't help with getting hired there. Um, and that was that kind of, you know, like I said, it was a moment of education, but it also kind of ended the conversation. So. Thank you. Dr. Baldy. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for having me and to everyone who put so much work into organizing this. This is really valuable and I'm really happy to be here. Um, I will echo everything that Dr. Katya just said. I have had all of those experiences and many more. Um, one thing I wanted to make sure I said was um, that I've had these experiences my entire uh, educational career from kindergarten to um, my last year in graduate school. Um, and I don't know that I have had great strategies for managing those experiences at any point. I do know that one um, strategy that I definitely adopted early on um, was to uh, play my gender, was to smile more, be kinder, be nurturing, be everything everyone expected me to be. Um, I'm not saying that's wrong um, or right, but I know that it's something that I've done. Um, and one thing I try to make sure I do now is to just be who I want to be and trust that that will be empowering. Um, it's been hard as a transition to being a teacher um, to see the gendered expectations my students have of me, and that's been a learning experience. Um, usually it was a top-down experience before, so it was people in power above me who had expect gendered expectations of me. Um, but I, I try to trust, you know, that uh, that being that being myself will be enough, and to to not yeah to engage in a little bit of self care in addition to you know trying to make the teachable moments, as Dr. Kasha already said. And Dean Taifa, if you will. Thank you, and thank you to my panelists for those responses. I have had similar to Dr. Valdi, too many experiences with something like this, not even just from people in similar leadership positions, but people who have different um, levels of power, right? So people who might have more perceived power or less perceived power than I have as well. And that can be a very um, diminishing experience. And so for me, um, I have found similar to Dr. Valdi, I think a little bit in that um, I challenge all of the expectations. I, um, I try to fight against whatever the perceived or expected gender roles would be for me um, and encourage other people to challenge why they think the way they think, right? In reassociating those stereotypes and assumptions and biases sometimes and trying to transpose it onto a different gender or another gender in order to expose where the fallacies in, fallacies are in those um, articulations of gender norms and gender expectations. Awesome. 
And finally, Mr. James Stukes. I just want to say thank you all for allowing me to share this this space, this virtual space with you all today um, on this important event. Um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I have not myself been, um, I've served on, you know, many uh, hiring committees, um, et cetera, in my, in my professional history. I, to the best of my knowledge, I've never experienced that type of um, behavior inside those committees, but I've definitely have heard uh, other women talk about these types of types of experiences. Um, and you know, during those times I've, you know, provided a listening ear, but also use it as an opportunity to reflect on any, you know, gender related unconscious bias that I may uh, have myself and find ways to address that bias. Um, and um, for the experiences that that are current that um that were in the moment, um, I have been able to um, uh, occasionally um, help address those situations in some capacity or another. Um, but nonetheless, I feel you know it is important to you know to highlight and celebrate you know the the accomplishments of women you know three sixty five and um, and this is, can also be done you know in the classroom you know with within the curriculum. I uh, currently teach an FYI course. So those opportunities um, are, are few, but they're definitely there. So I think it's important to, kind of, to make sure that is incorporated, you know, um, within curriculum, but also just everyday professional and personal life. Thank you so much for all of your thoughtful responses. I do have one last question before we move on to the next topic. In understanding that gender, gender treatment can result in gender dis discrepancies in the classroom. One example that immediately comes to mind is the participation and engagement in the classroom, where students who identify as men may lead and dominate the classroom discussion, discussions. How do you endeavor to address these, this and other gender dis discrepancies in the classroom and support your students who identify as women? If I could start with doc, Dr. Belflat, Baldy. Um, yeah, so I haven't in particular had the experience that more of my students who identify as women are, are quieter. Um, I take my uh, responsibilities as a moderator of, co of classroom conversation seriously. Uh, it's not fair to, to students when any individual, uh, regardless of their identity, uh, is dominant in the classroom. It doesn't create for a, a good educational experience. But I also just try to remember that my students are, they have intersectional identities and they are complex people who are coming to class in different moods with different levels of energy on any given day um, and, and trying to show up for them the best that I can to meet them where they are. Um, the other thing I was tempted to say, and I will half say, uh, is that I, I teach content, right? I um, I don't teach it just for my female students. I think these issues are for everyone, but I, you know, I teach feminism. I teach about epistemic injustice. I try to make sure that we are, that there's content in my classroom that might help my students identify their experiences that they're having as people and to name um, injustice when, when they experience it. Thank you. Uh, Dean Taifa. Thank you. I think I also, similar to James, taught an FYI section last uh, semester, and they were a great, great group to have. For me, in going into the classroom and understanding that these um, discrepancies or disparities exist across um, gender, it was important for me to establish um, values in the classroom Right, and to not only just say these are my values and I'm imposing it onto you, but to really have the students understand that these disparities exist by providing them um, with research. And then they, we as a classroom created our own values that they were committed to and that they held each other um, to as well. They held each other accountable to the values that we created in order to ensure that we limited um, the occurrence of these disparities in the classroom, especially as it related to um, classroom engagement and who was leading or dominating 
um, the classroom discussion. So for me, it was really important at the outset to educate students about the disparities that exist and to allow those who identify as men to really, like Mr. Stukes mentioned, to really be able to be an accomplice in eradicating these disparities when they exist and when they may come up into the classroom, but to also empower women to be able to use their voice and to take up all the space and be their true authentic selves. I think that was really important and something that I made a point to do in my classroom. Thank you. Mr. Stukes. Um, I'll say, um... For me, you know, addressing these endeavors, you know, begins on the first day of class by, you know, um, setting those expectations for the classroom environment, um, which involves, you know, respect towards others in the class. I, I tell my, uh, my students when I teach FYI, and I always, I always tell them, I said, you know, um, you're in college now, so it's not like you're no longer competing for the top spot in college, you, you're, you're here. So as classmates, um, help one another, encourage one another, be there for one another. Because um, in four years down the road, you'll walk across the stage together. So, um, but also as an instructor, you know, building relationships early, early on is key in being able to address situations, uh, particularly of uh, discussion dominance and effectively being able to uh, direct that student to listen and, and allow others to contribute. Um, I've heard from several students, you know, from other experiences in other classrooms, you know, with um, with dominance and um, particularly male dominance, and um, you know the inability to essentially shut it down because um, you want to um, you don't want to uh, uh, decrease the the students' momentum because you want that encouragement in the classroom. At the same time, you know there has to be a fine balance, and I think you know during that first week first couple of days of class is, is important to um, to set those expectations and, and, and um, define what that balance looks like um, uh, amongst the, the students in the class. Thank you all for your thoughtful responses. I would now like to shift into our discussion of the discussion to a sorry, topic. Nikia, that I'm sorry. Um, do we want to ask Dr. Katya to weigh in on this question as well. Oh, I apologize, Dr. Katya. Oh, no problem. Um, thank you, Dean Taifa. And um, I, listening to all of you talk, I'm so impressed with the, the approaches that you've taken. I have to say, when I read this question, um, it hit me kind of personally because as a woman in an underrepresented field, I have very much felt the weight of being the only woman in the classroom and the feeling of when I speak up, I this is not necessarily accurate, but I could feel as though the questions I'm asking, the things that I'm saying are not just me asking them, but that they reflect on my entire gender, which is, which is a lot. I'm not suggesting that um, students out there that that's a, an accurate perception, but it, is, it was very something I very much have felt as a student. Um, and so one of the things that I tend to do in the classroom is to, and I think this serves a double purpose of creating space for women and um, signaling to anyone who might dominate to, to slow it down, take it back a notch. Um, and that's to create lots of moments of pause. So I'll you know, pose a question, I'll, you know, we'll be working on a problem together and I'll tell everyone to, I won't say who knows this sometimes. Sometimes I'll just say, just think about it, take your time. Um, sometimes I'll say, take your time, talk to the person next to you. And another tactic that I use is I'll have students work on something I'll just walk around and look at what they're doing and give them feedback individually before calling on students to share as a group. Um, just because it, again, it, it disrupts that, um, that dominant and anyone being a dominant speaker and gives everyone a chance to get their thoughts together before they speak up, to feel confident that the contributions they're making um, are really gonna be positive because I want everyone to contribute and I want them to feel that their contributions are positive, which I did not always feel as a student. Thank you so much for sharing that, as well as all the other panel responses. And please, uh, if at any point I am rambling or am I moving too fast, please stop me. Um, so as mentioned earlier, I would like to transition to a discussion of the concept of toxic masculinity. So.
the journal of the journal of school of philosophy states that the console that toxic masculinity is the constellation of social regress regressive masculinity tra masculine traits that serve to foster domination and devaluation of women women homophobia and warrant violence so to be clear toxic masculinity has been established to be harmful to all genders and because it accepts glorify glorifies and places significance on exaggerated masculinity masculine traits and ignore ignores others which also brings me this to this slide which contains examples of toxic masculinity and please be advised we are not saying that masculinity itself is toxic but this this exaggerated version of masculinity or what is considered to be most masculine is unhealthy and toxic. With this, it does bring me to a question for our wonderful panel. Toxic masculinity operates across multiple phenomena. Some ver they take various forms, such as locker room talk, mansplaining, gender based microaggressions, and become preventative income, become prevalent in learning environments like Walford. Can you share an experience of toxic masculinity that took place in your classroom? And why, what did you find useful in overcoming toxic masculinity? If I could still please start with Dean Taifa. Thanks, Nikia. Like I said, my, um, my FYI students are some of my absolute faves. And so, um, but that doesn't mean that they are perfect either, right? They're pretty close. But there were experiences in the classroom that um, would fall into this category of toxic masculinity. And one in particular um, is when a student we were discussing um, we were discussing cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation during Halloween. And we shared a video talking about why it was disrespectful to dress up as a indigenous person or as a native American, right? And um, I put quotes around that because you, a people's culture is not costume. And so I wanna make that clear right now, right here. Um, but this student in particular was a bit confused, right? He said, well, you know, this is my culture, right? Um, you know, the, the pilgrims came over here and, and that's American culture. So therefore I should be able to, to wear what I want, to do what I want. Um, and so the response in the classroom was, well, wait a minute, we're gonna talk about this. We're going to discuss it and we're going to deconstruct what it is you're saying. You're saying that you have authority over an entire group because of the fact of um, colonization, which was essentially a genocide, right? And so in understanding what it was um, that he was trying to say, it was important for me to try to understand his perspective and then provide him with information to that countered that perspective and able to allow him to take a different one, right? Or to at least be aware that there are different um, perspectives on this issue and to be able to use cultural humility or standing in someone else's shoes in order to understand why this was wrong was a very useful tool in order to get him to at least attempt or to think about how to reframe his understanding of this horrific event, right? That decimated an entire group and population of people um, to the brink of extinction, right? Um, and so that was one example in the classroom for me and I'll pass it to Mr. Stoops. Um, I will say, um, yeah, that I, I had one occasion, uh, actually in my first year, uh, teaching uh, FY at Walford, um, had a, uh, a male student uh, use a, um, he made a homophobic statement and um, thought, it uh, made a joke and thought it was funny. Um, and, you know, I'm new at Walford, had been there a couple months and 
but you know, I knew it had to be addressed, not not later, um, not in the next class period, not behind the scenes, but you know, right there then in class, um, for for the sake of the environment and for the, you know for the impact that was that was had potentially had. So um, so ad addressing it is very important when it occurs. Um, uh, I was conscious to make sure that um, my language did not validate or in, in any way or excuse the the students' um, actions. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it occurred towards the end of class, you know, we, but we used the rest of the class period to kind of talk to talk about what occurred, um, the intent versus the impact, um, and did so without, you know, without asking, um, you know, other folks to contribute if, you know, if they want to contribute, but not pinpointing or saying like, hey, what, what do you think? Um, uh, you know, professionally, I've been in meetings where um, it seemed as though as women were um, a woman or a woman in, in a meeting were being overtalked by uh, folks, other folks in the meeting, particularly men. And, you know, and then in situations like that, you know, I often have to use, you know, my male privilege to redirect by stating, hey, I, I believe, I believe so-and-so wanted to contribute to the conversation um, to kind of interrupt and interject, you know, that, that, um, that behavior just to kind of ensure that, you know, it doesn't happen. And um, so it's, uh, um, um, you know, uh, overcoming toxic mas masculinity takes, um, you know, definitely takes practice, but, you know, it's also a learning um, as well. So, um, so it's, but uh, as, as you are aware of it, it's, it's important to address it and to um, um, mitigate it. Thank you so much. Um, if I could hear from Dr. Kata, Katia. Yeah, so um, I think this is probably just by nature of the subject that I teach. Um, it doesn't come across so much in the, the content, but I'd see it in the group interactions. Um, and this is something I also experienced as a student where um, there's an, you know, the, the sense of, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let me teach this to you. Um, and I mean, one example I can just speak of for me was being told at one point by when I was taking an upper level mathematical or differential geometry course. So very advanced geometry. And someone said, oh, I did really well in geometry in high school. I can help you out if you need a hand. Um, so th things like that. And I think that that does happen a lot in smaller group dynamics. Um, and I love using small group dynamics in my classes, but it's something I'm really aware of when I'm putting students together in groups. Um, and I try to make sure that I'm kind of paying attention to who's in the groups um, and how that dynamic looks. So again, I wanna be really kind of aware of and walking around the room, checking in to make sure that everyone is able to contribute. And I'm aware of the body language that's going on that, you know, if, if someone's just kind of leaning back, then that means that they're, that that could be a sign that they're not being pulled in, that they're being talked over. So that's how I've seen that come in my classroom. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Vlad. Yeah. Um, so I, I see this quite a, a quite a bit in my classroom, uh, not just to, to my students, but I experience quite a bit of this. I have students interrupt me, talk over me. Um, I've had students swear at me, not just at Wofford. Um, and, and one thing I find very important is to sort of challenge this norm of of uh, combative discourse that exists, particularly in my discipline. So in philosophy, there's this idea that, you know, almost as we were talking about before, I don't experience my female students as quiet, but I do experience this phenomenon of domination as a conversational tactic. Um, and it's almost, it, or has historically been applauded in my discipline as something that we see as valuable or good or how you win an argument. Um, and I really try to make sure that those aren't the conversation norms in my classroom and that uh, there's a conversation of collaborative discourse uh, that we're trying to work together to enlighten each other um, and and trying to make sure that, you know, it, moments that moments of that can be really difficult moments, moments of high emotion that you're prepared for them and that you do your best to uh, remain level headed and and, um, you know, not let not let the domination, which is a part of our larger culture, uh, get the best of you or anybody else in the classroom. 
Thank you all for your wonderful uh, responses. And thinking about the complex, the complices and the spaces for those individuals and begging begs the question of the conditions that exist that would require the need to have to have those accomplices. And which brings me to the next topic. Gender roles and stereotypes of gender biases. So of course, at the bottom of, your, of your, this PowerPoint is the definition of gender stereotype, gender stereotypes. And we and please take a moment to soak that in. All right. And on this slide, we have a, two brief examples. But the question I would like to first pose to the panel is, due to the reality of the counter stereotype threat or a situation where a person may feel at risk for deviating from traditional gender norms, individuals feel compelled to adhere to gender stereotypes. Those expectations for a, for a woman can include, but are not limited to, wearing makeup, behaving in a more nurturing way, way, having a lighter sounding voice or wearing more feminine clothing. Panel, how have you contributed to ensuring that women can show their authentic sel selves in your class or in a Zoom room? And I would like to first start by um, speaking with Dr. Katya. All right. Um, well, I do have the advantage that the subject, the subject I teach buck stereotypes. And so, um, so I go with that. I let students see that I am really excited to be doing math with them. Um, and that I'm not afraid to deviate from that gender norm. And I think that the more that students see me showing up as my authentic self, it opens the door for them to show up authentically. I also ask students about their interests, about what motivates them, what's important to them. Um, I like si assigning projects. I, I like for students to go explore the subject that we're learning about, but, um, but in a way that's, that particularly is meaningful to them. And I choose examples, once I, as I get to know what their interests are, I'll choose examples in class to connect with the interests that they share with me. Um, and I think that if I show that I care about their authentic selves, they're more likely to bring that to the classroom. Um, alongside that though, I do share information about myself. I think all my students know um, about a little bit about my family. If I had a rough day, they know about that. Um, they know about my love for Kansas basketball. Um, and so things like that, again, just showing them that I'm willing to share with them who I am authentically, even if it doesn't match what someone's expectations might be. And that I really want to know what drives them and that will make our time together more meaningful. Um, and just as a side note also, I, don't, I tend to not compliment women on their appearance. Um, so that's just kind of a little thing that, um, you know, there's that's a kind of apropos of not necessarily the classroom, but in general. So. Thank you so much. Dr. Baldi. Yeah. Um, similarly, actually, to what Dr. Katya was saying, I, um, people don't, I don't think they know this or they don't have this stereotype maybe uh, fresh in their minds the way we do with math, but actually philosophy is one of the most male dominated. It is more male dominated than most sciences. Um, we rank just behind engineering. So um, that's terrible, actually. I don't know why I said that with a smile. Um, but that being said, I, I do take it that my presence and my, uh, my showing up is a part of of uh, trying to make space um, for people to be them full, their full selves, I feel very strongly that that being being myself and holding firm to who I am is is an, is an imp is a very important ingredient in in making my students feel comfortable showing up as themselves. Um, that being said, I also try to make space for what I want space for myself, which is that you're not the same every day, and you know maybe you're not 
jiving with this today or this class or this semester and to always remember that that's not an indictment of me or my course or anything that's happening. Um, we have seasons of life and uh, to, to make sure that there's a variety of things. One thing I like to do is, is uh, give students some choice in terms of what we what they do, what topics they work on, what stuff we do to make sure that choice, their active choice is a part of what we do. Um, and if that's still, you know, if, yeah, I guess that to, 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 to not have the expectation that they're able to show up 100% in my room every day and to let that be okay, to make space for it to be true that they do show up, but to not expect that it's, you know, Sometimes you just wait, you know, I wake up and have bad days. It's, we all have to be able to just not be there today, so. Thank you. Dean Taifa. Is that Prince in the background, Nakia? <laughs> <So, Yeah. laughs> Nakia has a um, Siberian Husky German Shepherd mix. That's probably what y'all are here. Um, but, in response to your question, I think Dr. Katya and um, Dr. Valdi um, have provided a lot of what I would have said. I think just to add, I would essentially say that it's also about creating space to include in the curriculum women who are going to disrupt this stereotype, right? Um, and, and this this um, kind of restrictive way of thinking about what womanhood actually is. And so in doing that, I oftentimes introduce um, or invite speakers to come to the class to talk about different topics um, who might not necessarily fit into these um, stereotypes um, or might not necessarily play up gender in traditional ways that one might expect. And so for me, that has been helpful in allowing for people to feel and to be seen and to um, be visible as well for the folks who might um, not prescribe to these very restrictive gender um, stereotypes and, and norms and roles that currently exist in traditional American society. Thank you, Dean Taifa. Last but not last but not least, uh, Mr. James Stukes. Um, everyone did such a great job of, you know, um, of stating um, some very poignant points, um, all that I would echo. Um, but I would, you know, just a, a lab cap by saying, you know, um, you know, being our my authentic self as much as possible um, makes students feel more comfortable uh, being their authentic self. And um, you know, and I'll say, you know, on Walford's campus, that's not always you know uh, easy thing to do. Um, it's hard to, to for me to discuss you know authenticity without thinking about the intersectionalities. You know, in regards to you know, um, especially black and brown women, um, and but you know. I, well, I look at students and well, just people in general, but definitely students, you know, everybody's coming from, from a different background uh, and different way of life. And um, so uh, I was introduced, <laughs> I was introduced to a student um, uh, during her sophomore year. Um, and this student um, just blew me away with her authenticity. And, um, and she and I, we, we talk all the time. I was walking across campus. Um, she called me and I was, and I answered the phone and she said, turn around. And she was like, turn around. And I turned around and she was, she said, I was going to yell, but I didn't want people to start looking at me. But, you know, like, you know, I love her authenticity. So I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't uh, exhibit any, any behavior to let her know that to shy away from being her authentic self, you know, um, you know, we, that's, that's something the society should, um, uh, so that app should advocate for, uh, as opposed to diminish. Um, and um, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just, just say that. Thank you so much for all of your responses. With that being said, I'd like to briefly cir circle back because I believe there's a main point that we have missed with toxic masculinity. 
So often male identifying individuals are not sure or unaware of ways in which they can simply be an ally or, or supportive of issues of women's rights, but an accomplice to women and support women's rights. What would be your advice to individuals that want to be an ally or want to support those rights? If I could please start with Mr. James Dukes. Um, I'll, I'll preface by saying that, you know, um, throughout my um, college journey and my professional journey, you know, uh, women have been, you know, the, the most inspirational uh, and, and admirable folks um, that have impacted me personally. Um, um, I, I currently work in the office space um, with with seven seven women. I'm the only man in the um, in the office space, so um, that you know provides me a, a good you know good setting to but um, you know to to be a, a listener. Because um, from my perspective, is it's important for for men who have been uh bestowed the honor of being an ally because you know in, in my eyes you know allyship is something that's you know that's given that's not something that you can automatically claim um you know to understand the functions of that role you know for uh for me being an ally means that um i'm either in the passenger seat or the back seat you know as i i don't want to influence you know the, the direction so to speak uh being an ally means that i listen more than i speak um uh, being an ally um means that I do my own research um, and is, I don't uh, rely on women or other folks to to provide me with the answers. Um, um, but I also ask questions when, when necessary and needed and to be an accomplice, you know, if, you know, it's just to to act, you know, um, if something is, um, uh, you know, um, action being directed, you know, you know, speak out on it or, you know, um, you know, if not, send an email. You know, just you know, um, if you let let um, those in action, those uh, actions um, uh, reoccur. You know, folks are going to think that it's the norm and it's okay, and um, and it's just going to you know infiltrate. Um, so it's it's important to speak speak out when when necessary, but also to, to um, you know, when being an ally, you know, to do your own research and do your own work um, in regards. I was speaking with uh, one of my colleagues, one of my coworkers um, yesterday, and we were talking about uh, womanism and Alice Walker. So, you know, we had a good conversation that, you know, that's, that's lasted, you know, 30 minutes. So, um, so you know, taking advantage of those opportunities um, is very important, I think. Thank you so much. Dr. Katia. Um, I think the, those only maybe two little things that I would add to that. And one is to just say that um, with the, when it, speaking out, um, I, I agree the difference between an ally and an accomplice is that willingness to take risks and the recognition that when, when, a, when women speak up on our own behalf, that we are taking a risk, that there's a risk of being labeled that the ITCH, that there is we are taking risks when we disrupt the system and that an accomplice is willing to take risks as well, right? And that, that's, that, that part of that speaking up when you hear something, right? When something seems off, that that is that, that taking that risk on yourself and an acknowledgement that um, we're all in this together. Um, the other thing I would say, and this is maybe more for, for faculty um, and staff than for students, but just being aware of hiring practices I think is that's one of the biggest places where I see the need for um, more accomplices um, and being aware that at least with gender and I can only speak for, for my discipline, but I know that there have been studies that show that if you bring three candidates to campus for a position in mathematics and one of them is a woman, there is a less than one third chance that you will hire that woman. Um, and so we need to be aware of, um, of how we handle hiring and, and make sure that we're educated about that. and be vocal in how we do that. Thank you. If I could hear, please hear from Dr. Valdi. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't add much. Um, like Mr. Stukes was saying, um, I, I have a lot. So I have a saying that I was taught when I was a summer camp counselor. And the, and the saying is, see it, own it. 
they were talking about like if you see a pile of dirty dishes do them but i mean it it applies to to this exactly and i think about it all the time in my own work as an ally or as an accomplice um seeing it involves educating yourself doing work under being able to identify something when it's going wrong and owning it means not making it somebody else's problem not waiting for you know a woman to speak up or somebody else you know you see it you own it see it it's yours um and the other thing is a is a short um when i was in grad school all the women were doing all the work to organize all the social events to do every single thing and this happens all the time everywhere and then without saying anything or doing anything a bunch of the male graduate students and um by the way my program was uh, 85 90 percent men uh <laughs> the, some of the men started to notice and they just did it they just started baking cookies and bringing them to things. They started getting catering. You know, they started doing this work that was women's work before, and it meant everything to us. So it doesn't have to be big. Seeing and owning it can be really small. Understood. Dr. Alexander. Oh, thank you for bestowing the title of doctor onto me, um, but I cannot accept it. Um, Dean Taifa is absolutely OK. And so, um, I think that the panelists have really um, talked a lot about what um, men can do in, in moving from ally to accomplice and really focusing on action. And so the only thing that, that I would add is that silence is violence and um, saying nothing is saying a lot. And so um, it is also important to be able to um, do the work, um, to be able to speak up in moments when um, something needs to be said. And I think uh, Mr. Stu Mr. Stukes alluded to that in one of the previous questions and um, saying that, you know, he uses his privilege to ensure that um, women have the space to speak up in meetings. And that same um, example can be applied in the classroom as well. So silence is violence, friends, remember that. Thank you so much for all of your responses. This is my final question before we move on to our Q&A portion and pa panel. I leave you with this quote from G.D. Anderson. She says that feminism isn't about making women stronger. Women are already strong. It's about changing the way the world perceives that strength. How do you embody that quote in your classroom and support your students. If I could please start with Do Dr. Baldi. Yeah, um, it's a great quote. And I think it's important that all my students know that I know they're already strong. I know that they are capable. I know that, um, that their voices matter to me. Um, making sure that they that they have a sense of empowerment, even, you know, I've actually never seen this quote before, I never heard it before, but making sure they feel the sense of empowerment that's present in this quote, um, through making sure I'm listening and that I value, that I, that I practice valuing them um, when I listen to them. Okay. Dean Taifa. Thank you so much, my friend. Um, I would say that I embody this quote in the classroom by incorporating, um, women into the discussion um, and also uplifting and amplifying women who have traditionally been excluded from the academy and from scholarship, right? So thinking about intersectionality, um, uh, black women, brown women, queer women, um, um, bisexual women, lesbian women, just women throughout the entire spectrum, Asian women, um, and, and the list goes on and on to ensure that um, when we think of the word women, we're being, um, we are understanding that that term doesn't specifically apply to only one group, but to many, many, many groups. Thank you. And Dr. Katya. Uh, yeah, so um, I, the people who went before me just said it so well. Um, but I do, I think that one of the ways that I try to embody that is by pointing out that um, a lot of times when we look at our disciplines, it looks like the work was done by men and, um, and pointing out 
at least for my discipline, women have been doing math. Women have been doing math a long time um, and society wasn't willing to support them. Women were doing math despite having textbooks taken away from them as children, not being able to take classes as young adults um, and being fired from college level teaching jobs after they got married. And so there are so many ways in which society has taken that away from them. But despite all that, women were doing math all of that time. And that that applies not just to math, but to lots of different, but to society as a whole. Thank you. Mr. James Dukes. Um, just kind of echo uh, what everyone else has said. I've been definitely um, trying to think about uh, what Dean Taifa said, you know, just kind of incorporating, make sure to incorporate, you know, women into the curriculum as much as possible. Um, but also, uh, um, I think it's important to just kind of watch language. You know, I know over the years myself, I have uh, refrained from using the using the phrase um, "Hey guys" um, when, when addressing uh, any group, but definitely a group of students. You know, my my new um, new phrase is "Hey folks," um, so um, or "Hey everyone." Um, so and you know, even when um, I have a class, I try to gauge and see who's in the class. You know, they're all students and scholars, but you're looking at the subgroups. You know, who. Um, who in the class is a student athlete and 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 in what sports? Um, so um, if there are football players in the in the class, but there's also um, women's basketball players or volleyball players in the class, I want to acknowledge and um, lift both you know lift them both up. You know, if I'm going to ask about the football game, I'm definitely going to ask about you know the volleyball game as well and, and check on the score. So um, I think you know, having that balance, making sure um, you know, for me being a, a, a a man, you know, in front of students in the classroom, making sure that um, um, that that balance is there, and that I'm not, um, you know, showing any favor uh, toward toward my gender. So. Thank you, Mr. Stukes. I'd like to thank the panel again again for your insights on these topics that were discussed and sharing your experiences. I do know that we do have a limited time, but we I do want to touch on this question that we received from our audience, as well as our audience members are well, welcome to hang out if they do not have anything to do following this event and same in, invitation extended to our panel. But the question is, in your respective fields, how have you incorporated gender theory into your class? Class, and and in a sense, how do you make your classroom intersectional? If I could please, Dean Taipa, I'll yield this question to my panelists since I feel like um, I've touched on this topic. I can say a couple things. Um, yeah, when I teach feminism, I like to start with Bell Hooks, who's a, a fabulous Black feminist. Uh, and I think it's really important that that grounds any conversation about feminism that is ever had in my classroom as intersectional. Um, and I like to teach, uh, um, yeah, yeah I, I, I live at a weird intersection of, um, of science and philosophy. And I really like to challenge my students to think deeply about what gender is and what sex is and what it means for those things to be and how we can have information about them. And really, um, when I do that, I like to use um, writers who uh, identify as non-binary. I like to use authors who do not uh, fit maybe what we, the stereotypes that we have. And so that's content that I replay, you know, not just uh, in, in most of my, in many of my classes, because I think it's really important to us as people. So I would say that probably this comes up the most when I'm teaching statistics. And the reason being that in statistics, um, we love to have examples with gender. We love to have, there's 50 men and 50 women and let's compare them everything is very binary. Essentially, we wanna be able to, to reproduce a coin toss. And so we, we use gender as the coin toss. And so one of the things that I do in my classes is because the, that's one example, um, but there are a lot of examples of um, situations that get used that I would say are, are um, problematic. And so I, I don't not include them. They're there in the books. Uh, I know my students are gonna read that but I talk about it. I say, 
okay, notice there's a lot of examples with men and women. And the reason that they've included this is because they wanna be able to categorize into two groups, but that doesn't actually match um, biology or social definitions of gender. And so just kind of pointing out where that shows up um, as opposed to just not including it or including it and not saying anything. Um, so that, that would probably be the, the most common place where I find myself um, having conversations of that type. Um, in, in FYI, I don't um, uh, use gender theory specifically a lot, but um, definitely the intersectionality piece, um, uh, you know, students cover um, diversity, inclusion, and equity um, for a, a two-week module, typically around October and mid-October, but um, I tend not to wait until mid-October. You know, that first week, um, those, that first week is kind of a week to kind of get to know, um, get familiar with the, the college, but also everyone in the classroom. So, you know, I, I use myself as, as an example to talk, you know, to talk about intersectionality and talk about all my, um, uh, my identities, my roles, and because um, for a lot of students um, coming in coming in from high school, you know there haven't been a whole lot of discussion in high school about intersectionality and different roles other than you know you know the, the typical. So uh, I think establishing those connections early on kind of lends for a better um, discussion and a better le um, better uh, lesson when we get to um, that topic in FYI in mid October. So. So in closing, once again, I'd like to thank our amazing panel and our even more fantastic audience for attending Women in the Classroom Part 1. Please be advised that we will be hosting the follow-up event, Women in the Classroom Part 2, which will be a student-led panel discussion on Tuesday, the 23rd at 6 p.m. via Zoom. If you'd like to stay after the, the closing of the event, you are more than welcome to do so, and please once again, thank you so much for coming. And if you have any questions that were not be able to be answered during this event, please send them to myself and I will see, see what can be done for you. Once again, thank you all for coming. <laughs>